Hello. Happy Friday. Ah, oh, just got off work. Hey, Sassan, what's up, man? Not only did I just get off work, but I'm actually, what's up, Todd? Going into vacation, meaning I don't have to work next week, which I'm really excited about. What's up? What's up, Happily Hafu? Animatable Alex, hey, hola. Fernando, everybody's coming. Yeah, I hope you guys are getting some vacation too. I took, uh, Blizzard gave us some of next week off. Hey, unknown. Um, and then I took a few extra days. I took Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday so I could uh, get a nice block of time to do some art, hang out with my family, take a break, kind of unplug a little bit. Vicky Knott, what's up? Nerds, Josh. Hey, hey, nerds. Your TikTok is sick. Thank you. I appreciate it. I try. I, um, I've been animating a long time, so it's nice to be able to share it with people. And, and, um, and, uh, you know, one of the things I've actually been thinking about a lot is, you know, I work at Blizzard and I, um, I animate in CG for all the trailers or all the storytelling bits, but like I've actually worked for another 20 years before this last five years in video games. So I've done a ton of video games, uh, since the mid nineties, right? So all kinds of different systems, all types of different games. And I know there's a ton. Hey, Jag, Jagdish, thank you. Uh, a ton of fans of video games. And I, I got to start putting some of my video game work up here. It's a little harder to get, but I'm going to drop as much as I can. Uh, because so much of my work back then, you know, you didn't have files that you could keep like uh, animated quick times or anything like that, that I could show video. It was all kind of on the disc in the game and you had to play through 80 levels to get to a boss fight that I animated or a character, you know, there, there, it was a lot harder to, to share your work in that way. But I know there's tons of fans, so I, I know on YouTube there's a lot of playthroughs these days and there's a lot of access to old stuff that I used to work on. Uh, so I'm going to I'm gonna do some digging, start showing some of my video game work too. Okay, I got a question here. I know you didn't work on Coraline, but how did, how did they make the other mother? Uh, the same way you make any puppet. Um, they sculpt it, or actually they des they design it on paper, uh, just like any character. They design it on paper, then they sculpt a maquette, and a maquette is a, uh, a version of the character that, uh, gets seen three-dimensionally, taking a two-dimensional design and putting it into the third dimension. Uh, notes are given throughout that process from the director. And then the puppet makers look at it and they're like, okay, how are we going to make this into a puppet that has to act, that has to um, perform for our, our movie, right? So then they design it and technically break it down. They work with an armaturist, painters, uh, facial department, everyone in order to make something that ends up on the big screen, which is the other mother. So that's how they made the other mother. What is your actual job apart from animation? Uh, that's all I do. I'm an animator. I animate every day, you know, uh, eight hours a day I animate and I'm recently I'm directing. So I'm not doing as much as animation as I used to at Blizzard for Blizzard, but I animate in CG, uh, the storytelling stuff, uh, in-game cinematics, pre-rendered cinematics, or uh, before that, I would animate in-game video games, bosses, enemies, playable characters. Uh, or I work in uh, television on TV shows or in movies as an animator, just animating scenes from the story in certain characters. Um, I hope that answered your question. Uh, but yeah, I'm an animator. That's what I do full time, professionally, yeah. Um, who's that guy behind me? This little dude here, 
the little troll guy is from a movie called Cat's Eye. Back in the 80s, Drew Barrymore, Stephen King film, where this little troll dude would come out at night and try to steal the breath from a little girl that lived in her room. And it was awesome. I loved it. And I will do a post on this guy telling you a little bit about the history and how it was used in that film. And it was really inspiring. So I'm really happy I have my troll. Um, let's see here. So all of you that are here tonight too, you know, one of the things I was thinking about doing with my kind of weekly, uh, my weekly live streams is to give it a subject. And last week the subject was basically rigs. So this, do you have to look at the camera when you animate? Sorry. Yes, I look at the camera or I look at the monitor while I animate so I can see how my frames are moving for sure when I play, hit play or move it. Um, so this week's um, subject matter is, uh, is armatures, moving away from rigs to armatures. So I was going to show you guys, hey, Kung Fu. Uh, some different types of armatures and yes, cat's eye and uh, just some of my thoughts on it. If you guys had any questions about armatures, uh, I can definitely answer some of that stuff. So uh, we will definitely talk and I can show you guys, you know, different types of armatures. Uh, my Viking character that you guys see in some of my test footage for my new film. As you can see, this is just wire armature with five minute epoxy on uh, the hips and chest, head, skull block. You can see I have a big mustache wire here so I can animate the mustache. I have brows in there so I can animate the brows. I have a jaw here so I can animate the jaw. Fingers, feet, and as you can see they have the tie downs in there. Uh, I work with wire a lot and I love wire because uh, it lasts a pretty good amount of time. It's really flexible. I like to really squash my puppets and move, uh, really push them in their poses. And a lot of times armatures are limited in that way. They're really nice and smooth, but they can't really crouch far enough or they can't bend their elbows enough. And also they become loosened often and get loose in the middle of my animations and it's a huge pain in the butt. So I enjoy working with wire. Um, if I have a big studio behind me like um, Leica, then an armature is awesome because they have teams that will support you the whole time you're animating. And uh, you know, that's kind of hard to beat. But that's also how you can get that perfect, perfect animation that you see at Leica is because there are these highly magical machined pieces of of engineering which really help with uh with the process can you please save these lives can't watch them at 6 a.m oh yes i'll put them on my youtube go watch justin rush on animation i put them all up there after i'm done on youtube okay got some questions here how did they make her transform while counting to three uh this is talking about the other mother again uh, did they need to make multiple skeletons to make the illusion of her becoming more like a woman? Uh, yes, they did replacements. Replacement animation is when you have multiple versions. It's just like a face or a piece of clay, whatever it is. You have to have all the different stages of it growing in order to make something change shape. So they had replacements in order to... Uh, to change her face, to make her stretch out, or they had some some winding stuff to to maybe extend the necks or the spine a little bit, but it was mainly replacements. That's how they do that. Um, I know you didn't work on Coraline, but how the, the uh, again that was the same same question. What's the worst thing to happen to you to ruin or nearly ruin a shot? Uh, I've had lots of, anyone who does stop motion, light bulbs go out all the time. And when light bulbs go out, the intensity of the bulb is always different. Going from a bulb that's dying, uh, from a bulb that's dying to a brand new bulb. So 
that really can hurt a shot visually. Uh, you can do some color correction and try to blend it, but it's hard. Uh, it doesn't always ruin it, but it, it can really damage it. Um, I've bumped cameras many times, many times. You learn how to do, uh, how to work with cameras and understand where everything is in space as you're working. The more professional you are, the more experience you get. But it absolutely still happens and will happen forever. So I've bumped cameras horribly to where I've, I've had no chance of getting it back. So uh, that's probably the worst that I've done. It's just a really bad elbow to the camera lens. Um, let's see here. What part of the armature breaks most for me? Good question. Uh, I would say most. Often it's the legs uh, when I animate because I get a lot of just big bends. And, you know, we're really good at, at making armatures now. If you can see, it's something directly out from the, uh, the middle piece. See how it has that loop there, that bend? That just gives it a little more leeway, right? And also you can see there's more than one wire in there. There's multiple wires. There's like four wires in there. So if one breaks, there's three more backups, right? So uh, these are little tricks that I've learned over the years because when I first started making my, my puppets, I would use one wire, it would break, and then I was out of a puppet. There's a lot of ways to kind of repair uh, you know, a puppet when their stuff breaks. But if it's not modular, like this one is not modular, this is a single armature, uh, having the backup wires in there is really smart. And I personally like my puppets to be hard to bend. I don't like really easy ones. I like to know they're going to stay exactly where they're going to, where I put them when I animate. So I'd say probably right there on the hip is the most common place that I've had things break. And if you see here the loop on the uh, upper shoulders there, the clavicles, that also gives it more range to work without breaking and bending on one little piece, like uh, like where it's where the rock is. Um, the more range you get, the longer your puppets last. Do you have an armature puppet made of ball and joints? Yes, I do, and that was one of my other things I was going to show you. So, when I first started stop motion, I thought that. You needed armatures to do good animation, right? Because I didn't know any better. So I had some good ones made, uh, custom for uh, a film I was working on and a, a video game called Dogonauts. Some of you might have seen my short uh, that I made with Dober and F Flea on a planet fighting each other. So there's more dogs in the Dogonauts. And uh, we actually started a development on a whole series and... Um, I never shared it, but one of the characters, there's all different dogs, right? So one of the characters was Nacho. He's this little Chihuahua guy. And Jurgen Kling, who is a uh, armaturist and stop motion artist from Germany, made me this amazing armature. And uh, what we would do is I would slide this inside of my mold, which is a sculpt of my character, and I would animate it. And this is very well made. And you can see we have a jaw, we have ears, I have brows, chest blocks, feet, toes. Always got to have toes and toe bends because I want natural movement in my characters, be it wire or not. Like I always put the, the, the attachments in the toes, not in the ankles or in the back of the heels because you have to roll that toe as you're walking, as you're moving, as you're jumping and flowing through movements. So when people have uh, uh, your tie down come right up in the heel, it's, I hate that because it just doesn't look natural and it really limits your movement as an animator. Um, <laughs> those puppets move so easily or is it hard to animate? Uh, all of these move easily. This, this is very, you can tighten the bolts on this and make it as hard or easy as you want to rotate. If you touch this, you would you'd be like, oh wow, it moves beautifully. It's 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 really nicely machined, and I can make it really loose or I can make it really tight. It's all up to me. And what I, I prefer my puppets to be or my armatures 
to be tight. When I worked at Leica, uh, a lot of the animators love their pup, their armatures to be super loose. Like, so they just, they just blow on it and they just tap it, tap it. And it just, these tiny, tiny movements. I can't stand that because I feel like there's risk involved that like if I bump it with my knuckle, like talk about bumping with an elbow, bump it with my knuckle when I'm readjusting it and it moves, I feel like I can ruin a shot, right? So I prefer, I go to the armatures when I, when you get a, a, a character tuned up before you do a shot, every shot on a feature film. And I'm like, tighten that sucker up. And they crank it down for me because I just, pref I just prefer uh, that safety of knowing my character is going to stay where they are. And in wire, there's bounce back when you're animating. Like when you put an arm up, if I put it up like this, it'll kind of go and it'll come down, right? Like, so you always kind of have to compensate a little bit, but I'm so used to it. I, I can do, I, I animate all my stuff with wire and it's 24 frames per second on ones. And you guys see it. It looks good. Uh, it, it's, it's just a technique and once you figure it out, it's great. And like I said, the the flexibility of being able to squash this dude like a ball into a little shape to get a really nice shape change while I'm animating is priceless to me. So I really, really appreciate wire. Um, let's see here. When you ruin a shot, do you have to restart the entire thing? Well, ruining, yeah, if you ruin a shot, you start over. It's better to start over than have a really big scar right in the middle of your work. Unless there's clever ways, which there are probably clever ways to hide or mask a screw up. Like I know there's all these weird blends you can do and uh, cross fades. Who knows? Like even Photoshop, maybe ways to to like hide some of your mistakes. But yeah, it, for me, if I really ruin a shot, like a bump of camera or something like that, you gotta start over. There's no real saving it. Hence ruined. Uh, T-Rex animated on wire. No. So since we're talking about armatures here, the T-Rex is my first collaboration with a Mexican artist named Eduardo Oroposo from T-Rex Productions. Here, I'll show you his, his logo so you guys can see. That's his logo. T-Rex Productions. Look him up on Instagram. He's on Facebook. He's a dinosaur nerd, really talented artist. And he, uh, he loves dinosaurs, right? So we found each other on, the, on social media and uh, decided we were going to work together. He made these beautiful po uh, dinosaurs. So he made me this uh, T-Rex from Jurassic Park. And I am going to animate it, doing all kinds of awesome stuff. Unfortunately, it broke in the middle of my animation. The last one that I just shared with you guys where I went on a walk at the, you know, the park with my dinosaur. Uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out. But it snapped in the middle. Unfortunately, the feet broke and the back broke, the spine broke. So I've been doing some major surgery just trying to fix this. And, uh, but I don't think it's very animatable anymore, unfortunately. Um, but I'm getting a new T-Rex, which is going to be wire. So a new cast on it. And that dinosaur is going to do all kinds of amazing adventures. So it was kind of one of the things about, again, armatures versus, uh, wire is like, I did one animation with this dinosaur and it broke and it also came very loose and was limited in a lot of ways that uh, I just prefer wire. If I would have had wire, I could have done this for, you know, it wouldn't have broken during my animation and also I would have uh, been animating already onto my second and third animation that I want to show you guys. But the sculpt is amazing. The uh, artistry behind it is fantastic. And uh, we trying the armature was an experiment. 
and we're going back to wire. So definitely check out his work. He de- he does some amazing stuff and he makes all kinds of dinosaurs. So if you guys want something dinosaurs, check it out. He's amazing. Eduardo Oroposo, T-Rex Productions on Instagram and Facebook. Um, what kind of metal is your ball and socket armature made of? Have you had any issues with Russian corrosion? Yes. I've had lots of issues with Russian corrosion. I should show you guys too. As you see here, you know, the tongue has wire in it so I can animate that. Uh, the jaws, the necks, all of that is, is real armature. Um, these are just wire here. And then a little wire inside the paws. The tail is nice big armature bolts. Um, so back to answering. Yes, so like armatures, right? This is, I think, aluminum. I'm pretty sure it's aluminum. But uh, when you put it inside of especially something like uh, foam latex, which is what most of my puppets are made of, if you don't cover it with like saran wrap and spray, like some kind of a, a covering, you will get some crazy rust and crazy, uh, you know, um, corrosion. So uh, I had to learn that the hard way when I first got an armature. And uh, I was really disappointed. It was one more of those things. I'm like, what the hell's going on? But the... Uh, Covering it with saran wrap and then there's a spray you can buy. I can't remember what it is, but it's kind of like a see-through Rubber spray like if you ever have tools like a pair of wrenches that you can put this like plastic coating on So it doesn't hurt as much when you grab it or whatever like it's kind of like that and it'll protect your armature um, Let's see here Do you experiment with ball and socket wire hybrids? Uh, I don't, but I have. Uh, I've had characters that have like, like this guy right here. Um, you can't see it right now, but he, so up lower body is all armature. And then from up here, I can shift into a wire arms, wire hands, wire neck, head, whatever I want from there. So I have done that and seen that done, uh, worked at on shows that had hybrids like that. Um, but typically, like I said, it's so much less expensive to use wire. And when I'm doing stuff on my own, um, you know, I'm thinking about money too, right? Cause I'm spending my own money making these kind of personal projects. So aluminum wire works awesome and it's really cheap. You can get it on Amazon. I just order a big spool of it and I can make a million puppets. I always make three armatures every time I make a puppet. So I can make three versions of the character. So I have a backup. I have one that's a superstar. I could, we call them, that's where our name came from, Stunt Puppet Pictures. Is we would always classify the three puppets that we make in beauty, right? You have the one that came out gorgeous. And we, we considered them like the, the actor, right? And then you have the second one that maybe came out not quite as gorgeous, but, but it, it looks pretty good. You can get a lot of use out of it. And then we have like the stand-in, right? And then you have the third one, which is like the stunt person. We called it the stunt puppet. And the stunt puppet would do all the wide shots, do anything that was really big and action-y because it was moving fast and you wouldn't see all maybe the the imperfections of the pull from our molds. Uh, but they were the ones that often did the most work. So the pretty actors would do the close-ups, but then... The workhorse would be the stunt puppet. Uh, what mistakes do you often end up commenting while you are animating? I really want to know that. I don't know what that means. What mistakes do you often end up comment committing? Maybe committing. Maybe that's what you mean. Uh, mistakes, man. I don't know if they're mistakes. Uh, uh, I don't think I make too many mistakes when I'm animating. I think I'm just flowing. Um, 
yeah, I don't think I make too many mistakes. I, if you go in with a plan, or even if you don't go in with a plan, I've been doing it for a long time. So mistakes, I don't think I make too many mistakes. I think things happen, good or bad, surprises or not surprises, but I don't feel like I make mistakes. It's just the unknown or the exciting thing. The technical part is just a technical skill. It's making smooth animation. That's just practice, guys. That's just practice. Understanding arcs, understanding like some of the really like eases in, eases out. These are fundamentals of animation. That's a technical skill. Performing to where things really have weight and muscle and thought and emotion and and life. That's the magic of animation. That's the special thing. So if your work's not super clean, it's just practice. You guys just got to really practice, study animation, uh, and worry, but worry about the, the performance or, or what you're trying to get across. That's the, that's the really, really important stuff. I always consider it like South Park. Who cares how South Park is animated? It's crappily animated, but it's so, the writing's so good. And the characters are so appealing that that's all that matters, right? And a lot, I've got a lot of examples like that in animation. If you have it where it counts, um, the rest doesn't matter. But but regardless, it's a technical skill. Getting smooth is just practice and watching your arcs and studying and really paying attention to what you're doing. Um, let's see here. What's the biggest mistake you've made as a creative? Whew. I, I would say it's not a mistake, but it was a mistake that's very common with young filmmakers in stop motion is you make films that are too big. And it's not even stop motion. It's all, all young artists. You, you have ideas that are too big. Um, you have to shrink that stuff down. I know how exciting it is. I did it. My, my first film in stop motion was 12 minutes long and it had something like eight or nine characters. It's ridiculous. You don't do that. When you do your first film, you should be having a few characters, two or three characters, three minute film. You know what I mean? That our, my first film took basically three years. My second film took four years to do, you know, in the garage after hours. And it's like that kind of a, a commitment, not everyone can do. And a lot of times people quit and stop in the middle because they grow beyond where they're at. They don't like it anymore. They lose interest. There's so many things that can happen. So my advice is to bring your ideas down smaller, at least till you become more and more, uh, e you know, efficient with your skill set, And you can, you know what you're getting into when you take on some really big projects. I think that answers it. So we'll see. How do you tell a good story? Woo! It's giant questions, guys. That's huge. Uh, <laughs> um, clarity. Uh, good characters. Um, growth. Character growth. Change. Um, study. I always say to study good films. Study films that work. Uh, good shots. A knowledge and education in how shots work. Film language. Uh, all of that goes into telling a good story. And again, it's just studying. Study, study, study. There's so much to learn, right? Filmmaking, puppet making, animation, lighting, everything. There's so much to learn. But those are some examples of how to tell a good story. Um, let's see here. What do I consider my greatest work so far? Uh, I keep getting asked this one too. Uh, my most formative project. I don't know what my greatest work so, is so far. I don't think I've done it. Uh, I really enjoyed my He-Man film. I really enjoyed Trace and Bake from Overwatch. I really enjoyed Overwatch from Overwatch. I mean, Cookie Watch from Overwatch. I really enjoyed Dogonauts, our personal film. Gerald's Last Day, Dorky Dead. I've made a lot of projects. Every single one of them was a huge part of me becoming a better animator, a better filmmaker, a better artist. So I can't put any one of them uh, as my most formative. 
because they each played such a huge role. If anything, Gerald's Last Day, my very first stop motion film, because I fell in love with stop motion, I might have to give that the the heaviest piece because I'd been doing CG for 11, 12 years and, uh, and getting my hands on those puppets and watching them come to life fueled my soul. It was pure love and, and set me up for what I'm doing now, which is, you know, I get to bring characters to life every day with on the computer in real life. And, and, uh, it's, I love my life. I love that I get to animate and make money and provide for my family. It's, I feel super grateful. Um, let's see here. I'll send you another email to sort out the podcast. Oh, okay. Sab dog. You are such an interesting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I saw your email today when I was getting off work. It was still in my inbox. Yeah. Send me another one. We'll figure it out. Uh, he wants to do a podcast. Uh, with me how did you build armatures whoops cancel how did you build armatures including head uh just wire you just take the wire like uh, that i have here you uh, i'll lay it over a drawing i'll do a drawing and i'll print it out to scale right and when i have that to scale i can drag the wire along the body like it's a bone structure and you connect it all together and then you put bolts in the feet, so you're going to be able to tie it down. And uh, it becomes an armature. It's wire, right? So it's bendable. And at that point, you can either build up onto your armature. So imagine taking this guy and putting foam around him, cutting foam, or dressing him in clothing, or putting him inside of a mold, which is what I do, and then foaming him and painting him when he comes out. Like... Uh, that's how you do it. And I'm, I'll let you know right now, I'm going to, in the new year, be doing step-by-step -step how to's. Uh, right now, a lot of the tutorial stuff that I have on my channel, Justin Rosh Animation on YouTube, has the basic steps, but it's really broad. And if you're a beginner, you're probably looking for something like, A, okay, get wire. B, put it on the floor. C cut with so I'm gonna do some tutorials like that next year so that people they'll probably be some of the most successful videos I do on sculpting, on molding, on doing wires, on doing painting, on doing sets. I'll I'll I'll, I'll start creating all that stuff. Uh let's see. In stop motion, which comes first, the animation or the voice acting? This isn't just stop motion, this is all animation. Voiceover always comes first before any animation is done. Uh, unless it's being dubbed for a different country, uh, voiceover is always first. You have to have that to even know what kind of performance you're give, going to give, right? So I'm an animator. If I have the dialogue that is uh, got a certain tone or a certain rhythm or a certain, um, you know, highlights, you know, uh, musical elements to the way someone delivers a piece of dialogue, I want to be able to react to that in my animation, right? So it makes sense that I'm going to choose my acting based off of the, uh, the audio dialogue that I have. Hey, okay, I'll be there in a minute. Thank you. Sometimes find it hard to focus when animating. What's the best tips or ideas for maintaining focus? Whew. Well, you know, I don't have this problem. I've never had this issue because I, um, I love animation. I'm also, you know, an artist. So I like sitting down and just focusing on one thing, sculpting, drawing, whatever it's going to be. So things that I do that help me is a lot of people don't agree with this, but when I go in the garage to animate, I have on movies playing constantly that inspire me as an artist. I have Star Wars, I have Jurassic Park, I have Cat's Eye, I have Nightmare Before Christmas, I have anything that I grew up with, Clash of the Titans, Robocop, Terminate, whatever, anything that super inspires me, I play it in the background, right? Because I've, I've seen these movies a thousand times, but they make me so hungry to do good work that 
it, I'm like bathed in nostalgia. I don't know how to explain it, but I'm bathing in the things that made me an artist. And it just makes me hungry, right? Like to animate. So if I put that in on when I go in the garage at one in the morning or 12 at night, that's going to help me have fuel to keep animating, right? Because I'm just, I'm just thinking about it or I'm, I'm geeking on something and I'll look over every once in a while and I'll be like, wow, man, that's why I'm here, you know? So that's one way I stay focused. Maybe music, uh, upbeat things like that can, can help. A lot of people say music is distracting. I don't, I don't think so. For me, it's never been a distracting. Unless I'm doing dialogue, uh, I've been okay with music. Because I usually am so focused, I'm able to drown out anything that's not what I'm doing. So even the movies going on in the background, like for the most part, it's just in my psychology. Um, let's see here. What are some live action films that influence you and your animation? Dude, so much. I just named like a bunch of them. You know, Robocop, Terminator, tons of 80s, freaking never ending story, Labyrinth, Dark Crystal. I mean, if you look around my office, like I got Dark Crystal over there. I got freaking Secret of Nim all over the place. I like anything science fiction from the 80s, 70s, 60s to the 80s, I was super into anything Harryhausen. Uh, tremors, any kind of monster movie, creatures, uh, special effects, you know, like Nightbreed, you name it. Anything from, from that time period, 80s cinema, I was so, Gremlins, I was so, like, so inspired by that stuff. Uh, and I used it as fuel all, all growing up. And I, I still do now. I'm constantly using that stuff as fuel. Listen to soundtracks from my favorite movies. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, let's see here. Got so many. Can we get how to get into stop motion if you've never done it before video? <laughs> so I think you're asking me how to break into the industry. So uh, I don't know if I can answer that, but I probably know, know how to answer that. Uh, it's The number one answer is the quality of your work quality of your work. Are you a good animator? If you have a good animation reel, if you have a good puppet portfolio, if you have a good sets portfolio, that's going to open every door you'll ever need. If you're not a good animator or you're at a certain stage of your animation growth, you're not going to have the opportunity. So you basically need to understand what department you want to get into and you have to work towards that. Um, if you are from out of country, which there's a lot of people from out of country uh, that are looking for visas to come work at Leica or to come work at some American studio or us going to London to work at their studios or Europe, um, you're real. That does everything. Your demo reel is what's going to open and create that opportunity. Leica brings people from all over the world if their work's strong enough. Uh, t television it's a lot harder to make that jump because TV does not have the kind of money that Leica does to buy visas and get people over here or whatever, uh, uh, sponsor visas. Um, so television, it's a lot harder. You typically have to be in the United States and then typically you even have to be in California or you have to be somewhere near those studios to get those opportunities. But I could probably do some kind of video on my channel, uh, just talking about that and, and maybe going into some more detail. Uh, let's see here. Could you show us how you animate in real time? Animating a fight. Yes, I will animate on, on live stream one of these days. It'll be weird, but I'll, I will do it. I'm doing a... Um, I'm doing a collaboration with Frantic Frames and this weekend I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to make a puppet that I'll be using for our collaboration. And when I animate that, I, I'll, I'll maybe live stream it because he has such a big audience too that uh, it could work out. But yeah, I always think it's just gonna be so freaking boring to watch me animate. Uh, and I guess I'll just put my phone up and you guys can just see me standing around for six or eight hours. We'll see. It's gonna be boring. Uh, would you work 
on at Ardman? Of course I would work at Ardman. Yeah, of course I would work at Ardman. They got awesome stuff over there. I would love to work on a Wallace and Gromit someday. Ardman's, yeah, they're legit. They're one of the big big houses. Does a reel need to be diverse or just high quality? Just high quality. That's it. High quality. Animation is at a professional level. That's all you need. They're going to be able to see everything they need to see, honestly, from one or two animations. You can tell if someone's uh, at a pro level very, very fast. Um, any tips for facial rigs or lip sync? Tips. Uh, tips. I, I think one of the old-fashioned tips is um, always put your mouth shapes two frames earlier than the sound comes out. Because a lot of people will go in and because they're frame by framing trying to figure out their um, the phonemes and the lip sync, they always forget uh, that the, sh the shape is made before the sound comes out, right? Like, ooh, ow, like things are happening before the mouth comes out. And it'll, very often stuff will be right, but you're like, can you just shove that a little bit, two frames forward, and then it starts to look really right. Because it'll be just a little bit off. So that's a probably really simple, quick tip. The other tip would be M's, mm, B's, B. Uh, make sure you're not holding certain frames for just a single frame because it'll just look like a flash on, on screen. Make sure you're getting some real reads on M's and B's. Uh, uh, because at the simplest level, like Muppets, right? Ah, bah, bah. I'm Kermit the Frog here, right? It takes two shapes to make you believe that that character is talking. If you're getting your M's, B's, and A's, and you're getting those right first, you're like 70% there already to good, uh, good uh, lip sync. So there's a couple tips. Uh, stupid question, but do you prefer wire puppets or armatures? I prefer wire. Wire. I do. I prefer wire. Uh, I, like cert I like clean, strong elbows, which you don't always get with bendy arms like this. But, uh, you know, like, I like strong knees, you know what I mean? Like, that are going to bend and give me an actual 90 degree bend there. So I appreciate that. And I really work hard when I'm working with wire to make sure my bends are strong and straight so that things don't look too gummy. But, uh, but I still prefer, in my garage filmmaking, let me clarify. In garage filmmaking, I prefer wire. In feature filmmaking, where I have a team, I prefer armatures. Uh, what should we compile for a really good reel to apply to Leica or some other American studio? Uh, that's too big a question. Quality animation. Acting. Good mechanics like action. Acting. Action. Uh, good walks, which is mechanics basically. Good understanding of weight behavior, mood, pantomime. Um, uh, that would be enough. That would be enough. If you're able to communicate emotional feelings through animation, uh, if you're able to understand dialogue, if you're able to uh, move a character around and have it be believable and have weight, you're going to be fine. That's all you would need to, to apply to a, a big film studio got to be good. What's been the most challenging character you have brought to life? <sighs> He-Man. The, the toys. The toymation I just did for Motu for the uh, Masters of the Universe. Those toys were so limited and I've only worked with puppets my whole career. They are the most challenging characters I've ever animated. So all the Motu toys. Toys. They're challenging to animate. They don't bend the way you want to, and they're super limited. Um, what's your educational background? I went to art school way back in the 90s, early 90s. Uh, I had a 2D animation background, 
and I learned the computer after I saw Jurassic Park. And then I got a computer animation job and I've been working in video games and computers for the last 25 years. Uh, but I went to art school and I've always been an artist, a 2D artist uh, originally. That's my background. Any puppet making tutorial you could recommend? Uh, yeah, there's a guy named Nick Hellengoss. Nick Hellengoss on YouTube. He's an Australian guy, puppet maker. He has some really great tutorials on YouTube. Uh, or not tutorials, but you can watch his work. You can watch how he does build up puppets. And build up puppets are like this. You have wire and you give them form through foam, like bed foam and, and latex. And it's all affordable stuff. And he makes some really great puppets. So I would check out Nick Hellengoss's um, uh, tutorials on YouTube. And stay tuned, because on my channel, I have a bunch of stuff on my channel. If you go there under tutorials, you'll see a lot of puppet making. And I have more coming. Uh, in the next year, I'll be doing, like I said, very basic tutorials. How to make an armature. How to sculpt a character. How to mold a character. How to paint a character. How to make a set. Because people are... My, the stuff I've shown and how I've made my puppets is just too big and broad for, I think, your general audience. Um, so hopefully that'll get you somewhere. Nick Hillengoss. Could you show us some of your puppets? I definitely can show you some of my puppets. Um, I'm not going to do it this one. Maybe next time. Because this one's about armatures. But you can see the T-Rex here. It's a beautiful puppet. Um... I am actually going to go down and have dinner with my family very soon, so I don't want to be hauling out all my puppets right now. I'm making a bunch of new puppets, and I'll be able to show you guys soon. Um, let's see here. Any stop motion software you can recommend? Dragon Frame. It's what all the professional studios use. Uh, it does everything you'll ever need it to do. Dragon Frame. Uh, I use it on my PC. And how do you become a stop motion animator? Uh, practice. You don't have to go to school. People think you, you have to spend thousands of dollars to go to art school. You don't have to go to art school. You can read books, Animator Survival Kit, Illusion of Life, uh, any kind of study, study stop motion, uh, stop motion filmmaking. You can get it off Amazon and just practice. Go onto online forums, stopmotionanimation.com, claymation or clayanimation.com, and just start to interact with the community. Uh, you can absolutely learn everything you need to learn for free on the internet. So that's how you become a stop motion animator. Practice, 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 and then make a demo reel and apply for jobs. That'll get you there. Uh, what materials do you use for your puppets? I use silicone, I use foam latex, uh, and bed foam, I use uh, clay. Those are the three things I use for any of my puppets. Some basic tutorial on lip syncs for beginners. Uh, I haven't done that, but I can add that to my list of next year's episodes. Uh, Go to Justin Rosh Animation on YouTube and subscribe and look for it. And it'll be under my tutorials next year. I can definitely share my process. Wow. How does Leica animate cloth or fabric? Well, Leica doesn't animate it. The animators animate it. Uh, the cloth and fabric department treat the cloth the clothing with a material that makes it kind of stiff so you're able to have it not wiggle too much but also they'll put in foils and they'll put in all kinds of little base structures that allows us to animate it uh, just like anything else they'll sew either the wire or the foil inside of the cloth or they'll treat it with the material that makes it stiff so then we can animate it from there um, great job on the T-Rex dude thanks Jim more to come. I got... This dude's going to be chowing down on some little puppet Justin uh, very soon. So keep an eye out. I got big plans for that, that monster. 
Uh, let's see here. What's your favorite book on animation, if you have any? Animator Survival Kit. I always recommend it. It's simple, and it's a great beginner source, and it gets as deep as you need it to get. It tells you about the fundamentals of animation. It gives you plenty of examples. It's really, really great. Uh, if you want a more general, that's on animation. If you want more general stop motion filmmaking uh, on Amazon, we'll get you there. It covers everything from puppet building, sets, whatever you need, cameras, photography, check it out. All right. Oh my gosh, so many questions, guys. Are you a night owl? Yes, definitely a night owl. I 100% that's when I do my creative work. Tonight, after everybody goes to bed, I'm going to be sculpting my new characters. Uh, I sculpted last night till later than I should have for work this morning. <laughs> yes. How do you create an audience around animation? Well, I don't know. I'm figuring it out. You guys are here talking to me. I'm amazed, right? So, like, I'm an old guy trying to figure this social media stuff out, and... The way I've been creating the audience is just doing what I love and sharing it. Um, you could do it as far as creating characters that is more like a comedy series. You could do it through tutorials. You could do it through, uh, I don't know, a unique, clever way of using clay. Like, like some of the people I know, they just focus in clay. Other people focus in more like magic or object-based animation, uh, like Kevin Perry has an, a magic kind of illusion angle. Um, there's, you could go any way you want, you know, uh, animation is an amazing tool and pretty much our imagination is the only limit and, and how it can be used. Are there days where you simply cannot bring yourself to animate due to one reason or another? No, never. I, I always want to animate. I'm sorry. I'm a weirdo like that, but I definitely, I just, I'm craving to animate on days when I don't sometimes. I, I and I'm, you know, I love hanging out with my family and I love doing actions and sports and, and going on adventures outside all the time. But, but I love, I'm always, um, pretty excited. I always have a million ideas. I'm like, I want to do this dinosaur chasing me and, that I want to do this character doing this, and then I want to do that. Like I got a million stories and ideas I want to create, uh, and never enough time. So, no, no trouble there. How do you do molds? Is it something that is relatively accessible to non-industry people? Absolutely. I never did a mold. I had no idea how to do molds. Um, I just looked it up. It's all over the internet. You can see a million tutorials on molding on um, YouTube. Uh, I had a, I got a DVD called Kathy Zung's Foam Latex Puppet Making, and it showed me how to make a mold. So I made a mold. It was it. It's, it's only, a, it's scary, but you just do it. All the information's out there. It's, it's a hundred percent accessible to regular people. Just got to go for it. Dive in, dive in. Uh, how many characters in my new film? Four. My new film has the Viking, it has a wolf, and then the other two I can't tell you about because it's secret. But four characters. How often do I have to repair my armatures? Uh, these, uh, like regular wire, I rarely, I mean, um, I don't know, maybe after three months of, of constant use, I'd have to repair something. Uh, they last a long time. A lot of miles, a lot of miles on my armatures. Uh, unfortunately, these require much more maintenance. You can get some really good, uh, beautiful, fine movement out of them, but they require way more maintenance. Way more maintenance. Um, all right. Do you think mathematics is essential for animation? Uh, no, I don't think mathematics is essential, but you definitely will use math. Um, I definitely, uh, I've thought of my dad many times, you know, back when I was a kid and he'd be like, I'm like, why do I do this, dad? I'm never going to use this in real life. Silly teenage Justin. And, 
And then I would be at work doing some math and I'm like, oh my God, my dad was right. I am using this, you know, like I've, I've found that happen to me like three, four times over my career. I'm like, wow, I do use math in my animation. There's definitely times it comes in, but it's only basic math. You don't have to do anything crazy. Um, but it is for definitely part of our job sometimes. What do you think are the best cameras for stop motion? You know, I don't know much about cameras. I'm really unknowledgeable. I'm using a Sony right now, uh, AS2, because it does 4K live video and high res images. And because of that, because I'm interested in mixing live action and, and stop motion, it was worth it to me to go for that higher end camera. Uh, because like on Overwatch, I did a bunch of mixing of the puppets and me, and I wanted to make sure that I could go right from live video capture, switch it over to still image capture, and then I would be able to uh, keep the perspective exactly the same so I could composite it easier. Uh, but I really don't know. I, you, I use a normal Canon 60D from years ago would work just as well in so many ways. Uh, if you don't need live action video, uh, how did, how did I learn more from you than I studied at the university of graphic design? See, that's the thing with going to school guys. I mean, I don't, it costs so much to go to school and 99% of the time you learn most of the stuff you need to know outside of school to get real jobs, to get real jobs, to really know how it goes. And if you're doing stop motion, you definitely don't need to go to school. It's too much money for a career that just takes you getting your hands dirty and making it happen. Uh, yeah, so I'm sorry to hear that, but it's very true. If you're doing stop motion, uh, hire a mentor. I teach animation. Uh, go talk to someone, hire a mentor that will actually teach you how to make puppets properly. Um, if you're interested in stop motion, you can save so much money just and deal with real humans that know what they're doing and work professionally. Degrees do not matter. Such a great work. Thank you. Uh, I'm so glad. Thank you, Vishab. Um, let's see here. Have you worked at Ardman? No, I've never worked at Ardman. I've only worked in the United States uh, so far. Uh, I didn't want to go that far away from my family either. Um, going to Portland was hard enough, which because I live in LA. Jamie Caleri, whoa, what's up, dude? Your animation is so elaborate and intense. What impresses you when you watch stop motion? Life. Dude, Jamie, life. I, I am so impressed by life and the magic, like um, going beyond pure realism, uh, uh, capturing, um, like like I've talked about this in many of my live streams, like the, the stuff that looks like it's uh, rotoscoped, like a lot of some really amazing studios out here do that stuff, I hate it because it looks rotoscoped it looks like people wearing puppet suits and i prefer going beyond beyond what we do as humans right so i want timing that's stretched i want exaggerated moments of hang time and zips and hangs and poses that are pushed beyond what humans do and um but I, I love that. I love real, like I love feeling like this thing has weight, this dinosaur, like that there's a mind that's driving the body, um, thought, being able to create the illusion of any of that, of real life is the reason I do it. It's just so freaking magical. So, uh, I get really impressed by, by physics and by soul, if that answers it. So, and, and not just soul, like amazing acting as in soul, but like uh, inner inner thought, inner, um, 
you know, breath and I don't know, like all those little things like that, that just create an illusion, right. Of, of, of a beating heart inside of this, this inanimate object. Um, but I like exaggeration and animation too. So, uh, that all impresses me. And cause like when I see hyper, 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 real, real, real stuff, like I see a couple of animators that are on, um, Instagram that, their stuff is just incredibly, technically incredible, technically incredible, but it looks like they a hundred percent rotoscoped, and and I just cringe. I'm like, Ugh, yeah, but where's your soul? What, what, where's it coming from inside you out to that puppet? Instead of looking at a monitor that's telling you what to do next, that's the part that are really, it just turns me off. I don't like that. I like to see. Um, something else, something more coming out. All right, we're getting there. Do you see yourself as an artist? Absolutely. 100% an artist. In every way. In the way I think, in the way I move, in the way I look at the world. Uh, in, I sculpt, I, I animate, I breathe life into characters that make decisions. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, 100% an artist uh yeah i love this stuff i love it i am going to eat my dinner my daughter just texted me said food's ready so great to see you guys again i uh, hope you enjoyed this talk about armatures if you have any other specific questions send them to me i will be doing tutorials and like i said every friday when i meet you guys i'm going to have a subject so this was to this was uh armatures last week was rigs We'll see what's up next week. If you guys have a request, let me know. And it was great talking to you. Later, guys.